If we could turn to 1 Samuel chapter 7 this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 7. I'm going to read the first 13 verses, verses 1 down to verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verses 1 down to verse 13. And the title of this morning's sermon is Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And the men of Kirjath-Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath-Jerim that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mispi, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mispi and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpeh. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpeh, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it, offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. The Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpeh and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under, under Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpeh and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, Ebenezer saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coast of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And so, Father, we are asking this morning for nothing less than, Lord, your presence, nothing less, Lord, than a miracle, Nothing less this morning that you would come, Lord, and make living your word to each one of our hearts. That even as we sit this morning, Father, in the house of the Lord, our hearts might burn within us, Lord. To say, O oh God, that we hear your voice speaking to us this morning, and we cannot deny it. We cannot deny it, Lord. And having heard that, Lord, it therefore would demand a response. I pray this morning that, God, you will be glorified in our midst and magnified amongst your people. May all that is said this morning abound to the glory of your great name. And may we be spoken to of your spirit through your word this morning. 
Set a watch over my own heart. Keep my mouth and help me to be faithful just simply to share what you've given me this morning, that you've deposited into my heart this morning to bring to my precious brothers and sisters. I do ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Up till now has the Lord helped us. Which one of you this Sunday morning, even as you sit in the comfort of this beautiful sanctuary, can say from the depths of their heart, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. The Psalms abound with such expression of testimony. In Psalm 46 and verse one, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. In Psalm 118 and verse six, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Psalm 54 and verse four, behold, God is mine helper. Psalm 27 and verse one, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? My precious brethren, let me ask you again, can you give testimony this morning as they? Not out of a principled knowledge derived from the head, but out of a conviction wrought in the heart by experience. That God is my helper because I have instances that I can point to in a string of various testimonies that I can draw for, where I've been out of my depths and out of my league and I've called upon the name of the Lord and he has come to deliver and he has come to be my help. The world admittedly goes through so many of the same afflictions as we do, we don't take that away from them. The world too lose loved ones, they too fall sick, they too experience hardships and difficulties. And if you were to stop some of them and to ask them how they manage to recover themselves out of such ordeals, some would be so brazen, I don't doubt, to look you in the eye and exclaim, by my own sheer willpower. Others will tell you of the support of friendship and others with a tear in their eye will tell you that they never have recovered, that life has thrown them some curveballs that they simply have not recovered from. As Christians, children of God, blood bought, redeemed, and sanctified. We are not immune from hardship. We are not. We are not immune from hardship. And as I just said, so many of the difficulties that the world face, we too at some point in our lives will also face. We too live in a fallen world, do we not? That is fraught with disease and sickness, death and decay. Such things are common to all that dwell under the sun, believer and unbeliever alike. Yet, if at any point, if at any time, you or I were stopped and asked how it is that we've managed to recover our souls out of so many dangers, how it is that we are still standing after all that we have been through. 
without hesitation, surely our response would be, God is my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. We can't give the glory to anyone else. The world does that perfectly well. But the Christian testimony ought to be, the Lord is my rock. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Psalm 18 and verse 2. And you see, when you give a response like this to the world who pride themselves in their sheer brilliance, who pride themselves in their humanity, you see how the fans will appear. If we were to mention yoga or mindfulness, crystal stones and meditation, that's all okay. But you invoke the name of God and worse still, the name of Jesus Christ. And people become visibly uncomfortable and visibly threatened. I'll never forget some years ago, I was listening to the Today program on Radio 4. The host, John Humphreys, a self-professed agnostic, he was interviewing at the time, it was about five years ago, a newly elected leader to a political party. And this leader was a professed evangelical, born again Christian. And I could just imagine John Humphreys as he was licking his chops and with calculated precision, he laid the gauntlet and fired the question, would you seek advice from God when it came to important policy decisions? The Christian who was answering this newly elected leader said yes. Well, you ought to have heard the mockery and the sneering for the whole world to hear as though he'd said that he would consult the pink Martians on Mars. He was derided, mocked, took to task as somehow being unfit for public office because he dared to say that he would consult God for his wisdom before making important policy decisions. This is the world that we live in, friends, a secular one and a godless society that breathes fire against anything that threatens to unstable its aims and objectives, which do not be confused is clearly to undermine and to destroy the Judeo-Christian foundations upon which this nation once stood. If you'd have asked a man running for office 200 years ago, the same question, the world would have stood in respect. But now, Christians are considered fools. Let's just be frank, we're considered fools. We've got nuts loose in our heads. Exist in society if you will, but please don't tell us about God. And don't talk to us about this Jesus Christ that you profess to have a personal relationship with. We've no stomach for it. We've no tolerance for it. Keep it for church. And this is the society that we increasingly are being called to live amongst. The agenda of our day is simple. To cast off the restraint of moral absolutes and to give to people the green light to do whatever they want. But you see, such a, a, a principle will last only so long, and then everyone does do what they want, and you end up with chaos and anarchy and rebellion. 
It is against this backdrop that you and I are called to live out our faith in God, our faith in Jesus Christ to the glory of God. It is against this backdrop that we are called to shine as lights and to live without reproach in the midst of a perverse a perverse and crooked generation, Philippians 2 and verse 15. And as I said, increasingly as believers, we are being marginalized from society. And freedom of expression and freedom of speech that allows us at present to live out our Christian faith in the public square is being curtailed at a rate that I've not seen before in my lifetime. They talk about tolerance, but it only seems to be tolerance one way. You tolerate us or else. But I want to say this morning that as Christians, we ought always and without apology, unashamedly, we ought always to have a living testimony of a living God who has done exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or imagine. And we declare that God is not dead, though society would love to have him so. And the great danger in our day is that we can become so politically correct. And this is the battle that every single one of us faces. I worked in the, in the professional realm in, within, within, within education for some years. But it doesn't matter which strata of society you find yourself in in the workplace. This pressure to bow the knee to political correctness, keep your thoughts to yourself, keep your faith to yourself, keep your testimony to yourself. We need to be on guard as Christians that we don't succumb to this pressure because I tell you, friends, we'll have nothing left of a Christian testimony whereby God can be glorified. We must resist this temptation to inverted commas fit in. The Lord has been good to us, has he not? And has he not by his mighty arm delivered us again and again out of many perils, out of many dangers? When we had no one else to turn to, the Lord was our rock. His continual presence has been and continues to be our guide and our stay. And when we called upon him, he was the one that heard our cry. In my distress, the psalmist wrote, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him even into his ears. Psalm 18 and verse 6. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Psalm 34 and verse 19. Psalm 34 and verse 6. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. This is our testimony. And we must never be ashamed to testify of what the Lord has done. I'll never forget when God came through so faithfully in the birth of my first son, Ethan. There were complications with the birth. And the doctors were breathing fire down our throats to say that my wife must have a cesarean. And of course, if the baby was in danger, we'd said, we would have said no problem. But you see, they were trying to hit targets and we weren't meeting those targets. Things were taking too long. And so they thought they'd opt for the quick, quick option. And I remember getting alone and crying out to God and calling out to the Lord and hearing from him that we weren't to go ahead with the cesarean, we were to try it another way. And you ought to have seen the venom in those doctors because we dared to challenge the professional medics. But God was faithful 
And Ethan, our firstborn son, was delivered in God's time, healthy. And I praised God for it. And I wrote a testimony and put it into words and emailed it around the colleagues at work within the department to give God the glory at what he had done. And of course, some sheepishly said, thank you. And others just said nothing. But the atmosphere, you know, the atmosphere, the label weirdo above one's head, nut crack, nut pot, you know, crack pots. But we have to testify when God is faithful. Because in our hour of need, he has been faithful to answer our prayer. Bless the Lord, O my soul, the song says, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Why? He has done great things. He has done great things. He has done great things. Bless his holy name. Now it's one thing when a Christian who on account of peer pressure hides his testimony under a bushel and it's easily done. When you are in a workplace where to come out and to testify means that you're going to be the laughing stock of the workplace. I understand the temptation and the pressure to just keep silent. And when everyone asks how it went, you just tell them it went fine. But you fail to give glory to God and tell them the reason why it was fine. Because you prayed unto God and he was faithful to help, to undertake, and to bring you through. I understand this. And it's one thing when a Christian who on account of peer pressure hides his testimony under a bushel for fear of offending others, for fear of seeming to be peculiar and strange, because they're ashamed to confess the Lord before men. That's bad enough. And may God deliver us. I put myself in that bracket from such hypocrisy in our day. But worse perhaps is when a Christian loses the wonder and the awe of personal testimony. When a man or a woman can no longer discern the hand of God at work in their midst, and instead of giving God the glory, we begin to attribute the work of God to the hand of man. It's easily done. Because you see that when we do that, what we are doing is that we are offending God. We're offending his holy person and we're grieving the heart of God. And the glory that belongs to him is robbed and given to another. Are you guilty of this negligence? Am I guilty of this negligence? I love to meet a newborn believer. Why? Because they're full of faith. And everything is the Lord. Everything. The Lord's the one that gave them the job. The Lord's the one that directed their path. The Lord's the one. And on and on and on down the list they go. God gets the glory for everything. But the temptation is, is that as we grow old in the tough, dry in our Christian experience, that we find that we are now attributing things to man. We begin in the spirit and we end in the flesh. And there are some Christians that for them, everything is just ordinary. And they themselves are even offended when Christians in their presence start talking about God doing this and God doing that. Some Christians get offended. Why do you have to be so spiritual? Your car tire popped and you fixed it. Why do you have to say God, so invoke God into it? And it's because we invoke God into everything. Because we call upon him and he answers and comes through. 
And I want to say this morning, may we never lose the wonder and awe of what God has done in our lives. May I never lose the wonder and the awe of what God has done in my life. May I never attribute it to another. May I never put it down to just chance. But may my continual confession be, you have done it, Lord. This has been by your hand. Because I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice. And he gave ear unto me. Psalm 77 and verse 1. So often God works through the natural to accomplish answered prayer. And at times we can be looking for a thunderbolt. And instead God sends us a man, our neighbor, But we need to be careful that we do not attribute the glory to man, but that we are ever recognizing, God, this is because of you. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, for 20 long years, the ark of God had resided in the house of Abinadab. Now, whatever was the ark of God doing in Kirjath Jirim, why was it not within the veil in Shiloh? That was where the tabernacle was. We pick up chapter 7 in verse 1. And the man of Kirjath Jirim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord and it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath Jerim that the time was long for it was 20 years and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord What was the ark doing here in the house of Abinadab in Kirjath Jerim? Why was it not in Shiloh within the veil in the tabernacle? And the answer is simple as we are going to backtrack in a moment. Israel had played the fool with God and given their hearts to idolatry. On one hand, they professed to be Yahweh's And on the other hand, they worshipped their idols. They honoured the Lord with their mouths, but their hearts were far from him. Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. And those familiar with the account know what scoundrels these two were. They brought reproach upon the nation. They were utterly corrupt and profane. And when Eli the high priest, their father, ought to have reprimanded them and removed them from public office for the sham of what they'd made it, Eli the high priest chose to honor his sons above God. The whole thing had become a sham. They lay with the women at the door door of the temple. They robbed the offerings for themselves, the sacrifices, and ate the best of the portion. And because of their sins, the name of God was dishonored in the land, in the eyes of the people. In chapter 4 of 1 Samuel, Israel go out to battle against the Philistines. In 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 1. We're rewinding some 20 years now from where we are in chapter 7. In 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 1. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel... Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. 
And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it comes amongst us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwells between the cherubims, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meanness the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there has not been such a thing up till now. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. On the face of it, it seemed that the Philistines had been invited to their own bloodbath, the ark of the Lord, the very symbol of God's presence amongst his people had come up into the camp. You hear what the Philistines said out of their own mouths in verse 7? They were afraid and said, God is come into the camp. And they exclaimed, woe is us. We finished. We haven't a chance. This is the same God who smote Egypt with the plagues. Who are we? Great fear came into the camp of the Philistines. About 4,000 men of Israel had been smitten at the first battle. And Israel had been forced to show their back and to retreat. And when you look at the pattern of scripture, when Israel lost the battle, it wasn't because they were weak. Because you have to remember who was fighting the battle on their behalf, it was God. And they never lost a battle. But when they did lose a battle, it was usually for one reason. Sin had come into the camp. Sin had come into the camp. And admittedly, the Israelites do well at first, because when they were coming to the camp in verse 3, the elders of Israel said, and they asked the right question. It ought to be the question we always ask. Why has the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? No, they don't say, why has the Philistines smitten us? They say, why has the Lord smitten us? Why is it that God has turned his face against us today such that we have lost 4,000 men? But they didn't tarry long enough to hear what God would have said. Joshua, remember at the battle of Ai, when Israel showed the back, he consulted the Lord, and the Lord revealed to him Achan. It was because of the sin of Achan. And when they sanctified 
and purged out the evil from amongst them, God again gave them the victory. But you see, Israel's hearts were not in the right place. They were not in the right place. And they figured that if they could go into Shiloh, into the very tabernacle itself, within the veil itself, and take the Ark of the Covenant, this most holy instrument, wherein the presence of God rests there upon the mercy seat between the cherubims, then they figured that God would be obligated to give them the victory. We learn very quickly that their ways were not the ways of God, and their actions were fraught with presumption, fraught with arrogance, riddled with error. They'd lost the fear of God from among their midst, and they'd lost the awe of his holy presence. Even the Philistines recognized that no such thing has ever been done. And yet Israel thought it a light thing that they bring that ark into the battle. And you and I need to guard our hearts, my friends, from losing the wonder of the awesome majesty of God. Lest through familiarity, we begin to treat the holy things of God with contempt. God was about to show them that he would not be held to ransom. He would not be held to ransom by a four foot by two and a half foot wooden chest. I mean, the ark was fairly small, four foot approximately by two and a half foot, two and a half foot high. God would not be held to ransom and was about to show them that he was bigger than this piece of wood and he would not be made to dance to anyone's tune. And though his presence and though his glory and though his holy name was inextricably tied up with this most holy piece of furniture, God was prepared to let the whole show go down that his people might come back to him on his terms, on his terms. Be strong, the Philistines reply in verse 9, and quit yourselves like men, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought, and through the horror of those onlooking men, Israel was smitten, though the ark was in their very midst. And they fled every man into his tent. And if you think the first slaughter was bad, 4,000 men, there fell that day 30,000 footmen. And not only that, but the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. God took their lives. God brought the show down. Because you see, we can't bargain with God. We do things on his terms. We do things on his terms. And my brother, my sister, we must never lose the fear and the wonder and the awe of God. I know Christians that are not right with God, but they fancy that they can fast and pray great lengths and that God somehow is obligated to hear them. He's not. It's the heart that God looks at. It's the heart. God had brought judgment into the camp of Israel because he wanted their attention. He wanted their hearts. He wanted their purity. 
And God judged the Philistines, but not before he first judged his own people. And the Philistines, for those short months in which the ark was in their territory, suffered no end of problem. And the ark was returned in haste back into the borders of Israel, where it came to reside in Kirjath Jirim, in the house of Abinadab. And so we fast forward 20 years, and the men of Kirjath Jirim, in chapter 7 of verse 1, came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirjath Jirim that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. But hear now the counsel of Samuel. Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Israel, Samuel said, do what you ought to have done 20 years before the word of the Lord was clear if you want to return unto the Lord because that was really the essence of the problem their hearts were not with God and as you walk through church after church in this land that once knew the glory of God the presence of God amongst them the fear of God was amongst the people the people's hearts were right with God. And when sin entered into their midst, into their hearts, and they lost the fear of God and treated with familiarity the holy things of God, God gives them over to defeat, to squalor on every hand. And we can consult this guru and that guru and find out the latest strategy to revive the church and to bring in the numbers. But the issue is the hearts of the people. When the people get right with God, God comes again and meets with his people. Put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. Serve him only. You see, Israel weren't atheists. They were polytheists. On one side, they had the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And on the other hand, they had all the other foreign gods, what they choose to, to worship. They had it the best of both. God on one hand, the false gods on the other. God says, no, I will not share my glory with any other. If you want to return back to me, you must put away your gods and you must prepare your heart and serve me only. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpeh, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpeh and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said, There we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in mass in this pay this is always the groundwork 
always the preparation that precedes the blessing and victory in our lives. When you and I have known great victories in our lives, and on account of sin, and we've, we've become um, leavened by it, and we've grown cold in our hearts, and we've drawn back from the Lord, and we no longer see his mighty hand at work in our lives. This is always the place where we need to begin, in brokenness before the Lord. In brokenness before the Lord. Now was their fast real because they were fasting out of a heart and they afflicted themselves and they repented and they confessed that they have sinned against the Lord. Samuel took them to task and judged them in mispay. When God's people draw near to him, guess what? He draws near to them. Not just with our mouths, but when God's people draw near with their hearts. Now some would say this is merely Old Testament doctrine, but the problem is the principle permeates the scriptures throughout. Look with me at James chapter 4. We can go to the New Testament and find the same principle. James chapter 4 and verse 8. James chapter 4 and verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. I thank God for the promises that are in the word of God. This is a promise. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts. And here it is again, ye double-minded. We cannot serve God in double-mindedness. Serve the Lord only. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. This is exactly what Samuel called the people to do in 1 Samuel chapter 7. And the children of Israel in verse 8 of chapter 7 of 1 Samuel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel. And the Lord heard him. The Lord heard him. Now their disposition of heart is right within them. Now there was a trembling in their midst, a sense of their own inability, a sense of their own helplessness, which in turn drove them to seek the face of God. The Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mispi. The lords of the Philistines went up against Israel in verse 7. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid. They were afraid. They remember what happened the last time. And now they were sitting ducks. But you see, out of a right heart now, they said to Samuel, go before God and intercede for us. 
that the Lord will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. Now their cry was one out of a pure heart. Now their cry was out of hands that were clean. And God was about to do a wonder in their midst. The people of God were back on right terms with God and a living testimony was once more to be their portion. God's people were back on right terms with God and a living testimony was once more to be their portion. When was the last time that you saw God's hand work favorably in your life? Such that you could not deny this was the hand of Almighty God for me, fighting on my behalf. When was the last time you sought the face of the Lord and called upon him to help and the Lord heard your cry? Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel and the Lord heard him. God was once more in their midst and was about to do a mighty thing. Let us read it here as we close in verses 10. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offerings, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But look, the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them. And they were smitten before Israel. God intervened because his people were right with him. And as they called upon him, as Samuel was offering up the offerings, and as the Philistines drew near to battle, God thundered out of the heavens. And we're not told any more than that. But God fought on behalf of Israel with supernatural valor and discomforted them. And that army was smitten before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpeh and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came unto beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it be between Mizpeh and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Up till now, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coasts of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. The situation of the Israelites was helpless unless God there would have been no victory. But the Lord had intervened in supernatural splendor, thundering with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines, discomforting them and smiting them. Israel had once more in the, had once more in their midst a living testimony of a living God. They had again something to sing about. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. Psalm 98 and verse 1. In Psalm 124, it's a tremendous psalm. Psalm 124, and this will be the last portion of scripture that we're reading. Psalm 124, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick, when their wrath was kindled against us. 
Then the waters had overwhelmed us, the stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. God had fought valiantly, had given Israel a living testimony again. And lest the people should forget the mighty deliverance of God, and lest they should forget the testimony of God, Samuel took a stone, a huge pillar, and he erected it as a monument, as a memorial. And the name of the stone he called Ebenezer, the stone of help. For hitherto, up till now, Samuel said, hath the Lord helped us. As I close this morning, I want to make two small points. Number one, may we never, as a church, as families, as individuals, may we never lose from our midst the living testimony of a living God. May we never lose that. God's people ought always to have a living testimony. Unless they should forget, Samuel erected this memorial, the stone of help. And secondly, May we never attribute to man the glory that belongs to God alone. I'm wondering this morning, have we need to cast our eyes back to Ebenezer? So as to remember what the Lord has done, lest we lose sight of the wonder of testimony. I know people, have known people, that to look back is too painful for them because what was then is no longer their experience now. And when they look back to Ebenezer, they see there it was when God fought marvelously on their behalf. There it was where God triumphed. There it was when God secured the victory because they were right with God. They walked with God. They served him only. And now sin has entered into their midst and compromised into their hearts. And they're double-minded. And all they seem to know is one defeat after another. And God is calling them back. Remember Ebenezer and come back. He third to hath the Lord been our help. Maybe this morning you say, I've so little testimony of God at work in my life, so little testimony of his abiding presence. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart this morning and he's simply saying, come back to me. And you say, how? The same way that Israel did. They put away their idols and served the Lord only. There are a plethora of ways that we can allow idols into our house, into our house, into our temple. They don't always come through the base means of bowing down and, and dancing around a golden calf. For many a minister, the church has become his idol. 
For many a minister, Bible knowledge has become his idol. And he's lost the reality of what it is to serve God only. I don't know what perhaps may have come into your life, but I'm sure this morning God would say that if you are willing to come back to him, then he is willing to draw near to you. And you will see the mighty arm of God in testimony in your life. They sought the Lord again and they were heard and God brought again into their midst the testimony of the Lord. This was the first victory that God had given to Israel since their time in apostasy. And Samuel was saying, he thirty, has the Lord helped us? And in other words, up till now, God has helped us and never forget why. We don't take away from the grace of God, of course. But Samuel was saying from here on in, will he continue to, so long as our hearts remain for him? I don't want to hide the testimony of God under a bushel. I don't want to allow the world to encroach and to dictate that my Christian experience must only be lived within some four walls. We are called to testify, but in order to testify, we must have a testimony to testify of. And I want to encourage you this morning, do not despise God's dealings and his faithful workings in our life. Let us ascribe to him the glory that is owing his mighty name, for he is faithful. He is faithful. And let us draw near this morning to God that we might see his mighty hand toward us. Amen. Well, thank you, Lord. It is your mercy and your grace why you would speak to us today in this fashion. Because we know ultimately, Lord, you are with those who are with you. And this is New Testament, this is Old Testament. And we see, Lord, that wherever we are not right with you, your grace and your mercy will call us back. My God, I do not want to lose the wonder and the awe of testimony. I do not want, Lord, to lose the wonder and the awe of testimony. God intervening on behalf of his children. You have done so many good things, Lord. So many for which we thank you. His third to have you been our help, Lord. But my God, we want to continue on that we might have many more testimonies in the days ahead. If you be for us, Lord, who can be against us? And so we humble ourselves this morning and we say, oh God, here in this church, here in our own lives, in the lives of our families, Lord. Please, O oh God, extend your hand. Work on our behalf. We will not try to be presumptuous. We will not try to bribe you, Father, with our religious disciplines. It is our heart that you want, and it is our heart that we give you, Lord. And we ask, Father, that you will go before us, establish this church, bring glory to your mighty name. God Almighty, that we would have a living testimony that God is present amongst these people. And that, oh God, you are driving back the forces of darkness. 
and advancing the kingdom of God in our midst. While we be with you, you will be with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.